Okay, we're ready. Thank you, Mayor Franco. I call the meeting to order for June 26, 2020 for the Historic Preservation Commission at 6.34 p.m. Tim, please read the notice of compliance. The notice requirements provided for in the Open Public Meetings Act have been satisfied. Notice of this meeting was properly given and published in the record in the North Jersey Herald and News on June 18th, 2020, and filed with the clerk of the City of Patterson on June 16th, 2020, and posted in the Patterson City Hall immediately thereafter. Tim, please do the roll call. Commissioner Corpo. Present. Commissioner Garcia Leon. Commissioner Garcia, you have to unmute yourself to say present. Present. Commissioner Wiley. Present. Commissioner Tate. Present. Commissioner Redmond. Absent. Absent. Commissioner Simpson. Present. Uh, Vice Chair Rafael. Commissioner Chetton. Kelly, are you there? I said present. Can you hear me? Uh, no, I can't. Yeah, we heard you. Okay. Yes, we heard you now. Chair Ahmed. Present. Thank you. I would like to move down the agenda to number six, new business, A. Lambert Castle Carriage House Rehab Evaluation. Uh, Director, do you have a report for this project for us? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, Lambert Castle is located on Valley Road within the city boundary and has for a long time been a historic landmark in the city of Patterson. So although uh, Lambert Castle seems to be uh, outside of the city boundaries, it actually is within the city's um, limits and has been for a long time on our list of uh, historic places. Uh, this application for the rehabilitation, the, the, I'm sorry, uh, the building is owned by the uh, uh, County of Passaic, and we heard a presentation about the rehabilitation of the main building um, last year. I believe it was October that the application came forward. Um, but maybe uh, Kelly will confirm when that was um, in, in a few minutes. Uh, the application at that time just kind of, kind of gave us a taste of um, the proposal that we're going to hear about tonight, which is the rehabilitation of and several ancillary buildings um, nearby the uh, main building with a very exciting reuse uh, program um, that we're going to hear about in the presentation tonight. Um, tell us more uh, about uh, the details of the carriage house rehabilitation, uh, although we already passed the design review application for the main building last year. I believe that these projects will proceed into construction uh, together. Uh, so. That's uh, my report, and um, we have um, Commissioner uh, Kelly Rafael, uh, who will be uh, delivering the presentation on this project this evening. Hey, Commissioner Rafael, do you want to recuse yourself first, and then yes. take control? Yes. Can you hear me? Just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Can hear you. 
Excellent. Yes, I would like to recuse myself so I can present on the Lambert Capital Carriage House Rehabilitation Project. Thank you. So, I'm going to give you control of the screen now. Are you ready to be sworn in? Yes. Yeah. Okay, appreciate your name and address for the records. Uh, Nellie Russell of 154 Oldham Road, Wayne, New Jersey. On behalf of Cusay County, 401 Grand Street, Patterson, New Jersey. And do you swear that the testimony that your wife provides is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I right, can everyone see the presentation on your screen? Yes, yes I can. Yes, I can. Excellent. So, uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to come back to present on the second part of the overall Lambert Castle and Carriage House Restoration Project. Um, we were back uh, at the commission back in October, I believe it was actually in October, because at the time we had anticipated going out for a pre-qualification uh, in the late fall, you know, due to COVID and, you know, sort of the docking budgets, et cetera, we have had to postpone going out for a pre-qualification process, which I'll, I'll get into momentarily. Um, so the first part of this presentation, I'll give you the general overview of the conditions of the care house and our proposed reuse. So the first few slides, uh, so in 1925, or upon Lambert's death, uh, much, much of his estate went to the city of Patterson, uh, it was transferred to the county in 1927. Um, you know, it was left sort of vacant and dormant uh, for a period of time. And then in the early 1930s, when Pacific County was establishing its park system, it looked to repurpose the site of Lambert Castle. So the first few images that I'm showing on screen are from the early 1930s uh, when they were at the site and they were, you know, sort of talking and developing a reused purpose. Um, so just um, for reference of the site's location, if you've been to Lambert Castle, you come off of Valley Road, there is um, sort of, you know, a fork as soon as you enter the property. If you turn left, you kind of come up to sort of a roundabout and then you would see the carriage house to your left and the castle to your right. So these are actually historic images from 1896 that kind of show you the relationship of the carriage house uh, prior to any site intervention by the county. Um, the building in front um, is no longer there. Uh, that is the greenhouse. I, I don't know if you could see my mouth on the screen, uh, but that was demolished sometime um, after the county uh, stepped in. So these are, this is the look of the north facade of the carriage house. So kind of going back to this original image, you can see a lot of the exterior integrity is still there. Um, in the 1930s when we came in, the carriage house was dedicated to the Pacific House, was dedicated to the Pacific County Sheriff's Department. While the council was used for offices uh, prior to sort of it being developed uh, as a museum for the Pacific County Historical Society. So um, the Sheriff's Office has used this carriage house as a motor pool since the 1930s. So they fix cars. Um, so the, the, there's actually a lot of activity. It's a very busy building. Um, you know, it's almost like every other day. They are um, kind of coming in with new vehicles. Along with, uh, with this operation here, across sort of the path, which I do not have an image to show you. Um, they had an underground uh, storage tank. Oh my God, my computer just <laughs> just stopped. Um, please stand by, hold on. Kelly, if you can't get it to work, I have the presentation on my side, and I can put it up if you need me to, and then you can just tell me to change slides. Yeah, actually, what happened, my computer, you know, it's kind of one of those 
Windows magical thing that just said update and the thing shut off. So even my entire screen is black at the moment. So um, if you just give me, I, I sincerely apologize. Uh, just a minute. Let it reboot. One minute. Okay, I'm back in. Can you see my presentation again? Yes, I can see it. Oh, I, can see it kind of like, oh. I don't see it now. I lost it. I think that yeah, was me. Too. I, it's done. Just a minute. I think I can. I think it was uh, my fault. Hold on. Okay, uh, we see your screen again, Kelly. Hey, Kelly, you're on mute. Um, on the facade 
of the building. As you can see more, this is the rear uh, of the exterior. You see a lot, a lot of vegetation and overgrowth, uh, which has caused, you know, water infiltration um, and some of the uh, stone to separate. And this image over here, I had mentioned about the collapsed wall. So this is, this was all a wall at one time, and it, you know, it fell in disrepair. Uh, the carriage house uh, complex, if you will, I'm going to call it a complex. Um, sometime in the 1980s, uh, additions were added to service of uh, the sheriff's department. So this brick addition was put on, um, you know, one as to uh, store the garage. So right now this is a two-bay uh, garage over here. Again, another image of the collapsed wall on the eastern side. Again, just showing uh, various uh, degrees of vegetation. In the rear, so now once you walk into the carriage house uh, complex, we have this brick addition. Uh, and then there is sort of a one level um, brick addition that was added to this ancillary uh, building. And behind this, which I'll get into later, is a two story brick addition. Uh, that serves as jail. So these were just, you know, office space, storage space, uh, classroom space, all for the sheriff's department. So I'm just showing um, various images of different angles of the condition of the current site. Um, today, they still have a lot of these buildings in use for storage. Uh, here's a better view. So here we see the two-bay uh, addition that was added. In this image, we see the two-story brick building that we use, that was used uh, as a jail, and still currently for classrooms. They have classrooms up top, or they've converted the spaces. Back here, um, obviously they've paved it. They've added concrete. There is another one level or one story um, part of this complex that you know it's really derelict. The roof collapsed. It's overgrown. Um, stuff is just you know, we have piled there, stored there, um, but it serves no purpose for the site. Here you go. You can see uh, the rear. So the two, um, the two bay is right here. This would be behind that two bay where the collapsed wall is. Um, this one level area that attaches to um, the two story building. Again, the roof is actually caved in. You can't really see it from this image, and they just have a lot of um, items stored there for disposal. So if you are walking away, again, this is just for uh, reference to where you are at the site. If you are walking out of the carriage house, you would come down, uh, there's this roundabout, and the Lambert Castle will be straight in front of you. Conditions of the site, again, it's a, a lot of it is asphalt. Um, this is a path that's off of that um, fork when you come in. And if you were to go to the roundabout here, this would be the entrance into the carriage house complex, which, again, is only used by the sheriff's department. All right, so major sort of, you know, issues to look at. So number one, um, the building, you know, what we're going to do to the building. Number one, there's a, a lot of repointing is required for the exterior. So we'll be working on all, uh, the entire facade will be repointed. Um, there's a lot of mortar loss at the brick, at the parapet above here. Um, we've also seen some deficiencies in some areas of the building for the brick itself. So we will have to do some, you know, spot repair and replacement where necessary. And we're still sort of going back and forth on whether or not we will repaint it or remove the paint. Um, that's going to sort of be more infield work when we get to that point. Number three, the collapsed retaining wall will be um, restored, will be put back in place. The historic openings um, have been infilled 
um, well, you know, you'll see them throughout. There's a lot of historic openings that were infilled and air conditioned units were put in. So that hole will be removed and a window will be put back in its place. There's a extensive roof damage. Again, it, this building unfortunately hasn't been properly maintained all this time. And with the growth of vegetation, there's rodents um, not being maintained. The roof and its entirety will need to be replaced. So we're calling to remove all of it and replacing it. And of course, you know, fixing the vegetation. Um, and taking all of that down around all of the brownstone. So you all see this on the screen. So the numbers correspond to the area of the complex that we are um, talking about. So now getting into the interior, and we have to we have to look at this project. Um, you know, there's been a lot of changes since the 1930s till now. Uh, the county has not had an invested, let's say, interest in this site as it was given sort of to the sheriff's department to to operate and administer. Um, so now that we are uh, looking to reuse the space, um, it's how do we how do we use the interior of the space that has been changed uh, so much over time? And um, I believe I have some. And I have um, pictures for you of the interior space. Um, we're pretty much going to, for lack of a better word, <laughs> gut the interior um, because none of the original finishes or most of the original finishes do not exist. Um, and just, you know, given what they've used it for, there's going to be some remediation work, there's uh, cleaning. And the fact that we want to repurpose the building for archives and a visitor center, which I'll get into a little bit later, um, we need to outfit the interior. So again, because of you know the exterior has been in poor condition, the inside shows a lot of water damage. There's mold that is growing. It's all coming from the roof. Um, there is no ADA accessibility at all in the building. Um, even the restroom facilities are not equipped uh, with ADA accessibility or any modern standards. Um, we were talking about the partial collapse of the retaining wall and roof structure of the ancillary building, so that's, um, that's causing some issues. There is a partial ceiling collapse in room 101, uh, which is down here, which as you can see, it serves as a mechanical room currently. Um, and, and actually, the second floor, when I get to, is not inhabitable. You really can't go up there, and people are working in this building. Um, the building also lacks all heating and cooling systems. So, again, it's not the building is not designed for um, for for use. So, in the interior, I was just talking about again. So, this is an image of the current bathroom in the. You know, first building, we're still talking about the first building of the carriage house. Um, number two, there is a second floor. So this is your only means to the second floor. Again, not used. It's rodent infested. Um, you know, there's a lot of openings, a lot of uh, plaster um, issues, mold growth, dirt, et cetera. Uh, number three, doors don't meet accessibility code just in general throughout. So those will be replaced. Photo four shows um, sort of the roof line, which you know there are some parts of the structure. So the structure itself and the envelope is in good condition. We can reuse it. There's not much that we would have to do structurally to the exterior uh, to save um, to save the envelope. Number five, again, water a lot of water damage is causing plaster um, cracking, uh, mold growth. And then in number six, uh, ceiling collapse from the water damage, as you can see uh, right here. These are coming throughout uh, the entire building. So again, um, there's two floors. So this is the first floor. On the second floor, which you take that stairs, I've kind of already gone over it, but just to show you sort of the layout, the current layout of the second floor, you would go up those wood stairs. Um, 
you, you can't go, <laughs> you really can't go in there. Um, animal, again, animal infestation, vinyl windows are not sealed properly. Um, so again, it's promoting a lot of water infiltration. The balcony floor um, has been showing evidence of a lot of wood rot. Um, and this second level, for all intents and pur purposes, is not accessible and would not be accessible as it is to the public. These are images of the second floor uh, interior. Again, just showing various voids in the roof, uh, deterioration, water staining, um, signs of you know animals living in the building, water damage causing um, you know the, the the walls, the floors, um, and the room. There's one room which is photo six, which this this photo right here particularly is the second building, which we'll kind of get into a little bit. That one's in fairly, um, you know, fair condition, and that's because it's not really used as much. Um, and one of the additions was done later in the 1980s. So I want to reference back now to the existing site of the plan. Like in the beginning, you would drive in. Your carriage house is to your left. We are going to, you know, part of this project it's not just the carriage house, it's not just Lambert Castle, it is the entire site, and I want to stress that. So, you know, phase one, we're kind of looking at into phases. So phase one is Lambert Castle, which we presented before. Phase two, we're looking at the carriage house complex. And then phase three, which some of the elements of phase three are tied into what I'm presenting tonight and what we'll, we will start with in our phase two, is the grounds themselves. Um, so, you know, currently there is a lot of um, asphalt. There is the retaining wall that goes around the entire complex today is in need of repair. The site of the carriage house as well, there is a lot of asphalt. Um, you know, pavers, so we're going to remove concrete. You know, there's stone work that needs to be done, so there's quite a bit of uh, site work, but I'll get into uh, finer details a little bit on, but I wanted to, to, I wanted to show you the site as a whole. Okay, so our proposed site plan, so kind of just, I'll go back real quick. So this is what it currently is today, as best as uh, we can thought. Right over here, I kind of mentioned before, was that underground um, storage tank. Uh, between here and here, and this is where police would come in. It would fill up here and move on and sort of drive down. This is the road, drive down out. So our proposed site plan and why we are coming before the commission. Um, during our planning process for restoring the castle, if you recall, one of the major issues of the castle <laughs> was water um, and water infiltration into the basement. Now, it wouldn't probably be as much of a problem um, if it weren't for the fact that the Pacific County Historical Society was using the basement of the castle for their archives. If you've been to the castle before, you would know that they house over 100,000 pieces in their collection and then even more uh, in their archival collection. So their archival collection was in the basement um, suffering for a lack of a better word, um, due to you know times it would either flood or if any time it rained, uh, gutters were overflown. Um, we we had um, some serious issues that were negatively impacting impacting their collection. Um, so we needed to move them. We knew we needed to move them. Um, when we were looking at the castle as a whole, you know, obviously the water issues, but then there was a lot of plaster uh, coming down. Um, we decided, you know, well, what about the carriage house? Like, where else can we put this archive that's above ground? Um, so we identified the carriage house as a um, site for, you know, the relocation of the archive. So with this in mind, um, we began talking about the carriage house and how can we make this a fully accessible uh, to the public um, and even maybe a destination uh, for this archive collection. So we've, you know, embarked on a journey. We're committed to housing this complex as part of the archives, but also 
knowing that um, a lot of people do come to Lambert Castle, Lambert Castle sees about 20,000 visitors a year. Um, when you come in, you know, it's very hard, you know, you don't get a sense of, you know, like the, there's no visitor ready point or meet up point. Uh, the gift shop is rather small, you know, when they do a lot of events, so it's sort of right into the museum space. So we felt that it would be best to also tie in some components of a visitor center experience, uh, which will be in this larger building. The archive will be in the second building here. I have floor plans I'll show you in a moment. Um, and then the, the, the third component is office space. So the Pacific County Historical Society has several um, between members um, and staff uh, that were also working between the basement and the third floor of the castle. Uh, all of those offices will be moved to, to the church house complex. And that's where we'll get into the second floor. If you're thinking now, the fourth would be, um, again, you know, we cater a lot also to school groups in Patterson. Um, and there are some outside towns that come in, but there's no stop for the students to, to meet and greet and to, let's say, have a lesson before they, you know, take a tour, for example. Um, you know, there's a lot of lectures, there's a lot of programs. The castle is just not designed on the inside to have um, events that, you know, kind of congregate people in one spot. So we've um, decided, again, I'll get into sort of renderings in a bit in the floor plan, to, to keep this space. Um, for uh, workshops, presentations for the students, um, you know, sort of as a multi-use space. So with that, for the carriage house, so the ground, the overall site plan around the carriage house would have um, a lot of improvements to correspond with these changes. So what is that? So to restore, you know, the original carriage house, um, let's say complex, uh, we are going to demolish, so I'm going back to this site, this entire two-story brick building. Uh, this is a one-story here, and then it kind of elevates into a two-story. And then there's addition on this um, ancillary building here. All of this will be removed. We are proposing demolition. It was done out of the period of significance. It was done in the 1980s. It, it has no use to us and it has no connection to the site, so it will be removed. Um, in its place, uh, parking, you know, with the high visitation that we have um, and the archives in some way serving as a different use than going to the museum or taking a trail in the park, there's trailhead like right over here that they can go up to the tower. Um, this will be another parking lot smaller, obviously, in size than what exists on the, on the opposite side of the castle. There will be a walk down to sort of a paved area with trees and, you know, site furniture, so benches, picnic tables, so people could, um, you know, come with their lunch or they can sort of hang out, you know, at the, at the complex. So this would all be a paved walkway. This would also be pavers sort of as a main entrance into the carriage house uh, complex. And then the path coming into the site as a whole, we're slightly modifying um, the direction, adding planters, adding lights, um, and a new uh, pedestrian walkway that would connect the carriage house to the castle. And then this walkway, we're actually even building a ramp. This is, this is elevated here. We're building a ramp right into the castle, but designed in a way that it would not um, sort of encroach on the, you know, the facade. Like, we didn't want to make a lift, um, so we're just we're changing the elevation here to have ADA, ADA accessibility into the castle, which connects right into the carriage house. Going to the first floor plan, you, you could enter the carriage house. So again, this is, there's two buildings we're talking about, part of this complex that are going to be restored um, and rehabilitated. So the site plan I'm showing right now is for this building. You can enter two ways. You can come through the main, this would be the main entrance, or there is a side entrance here. I'm going to <laughs> of the room. 
Okay, so right now, uh, when you enter the first floor, you know, we'll have restrooms that are ADA accessible. It'll be a gift shop, sort of a starting point, again, for your tours, for your program purchases. Um, you know, we have a mechanical room, sort of a luncheon slash kitchen, because, you know, it is anticipated with programs that there might be, you know, food or something that we would have to serve, so we designed a kitchenette in here. I had mentioned the program space. So this is the large, the multi-purpose room, if you will, is back here. Then across the way, which, you know, is kind of poking, because it is two different things, um, and I realize it's on one site plan, I'm on page here, but I will show, so this is the main building. The second building, which again is separate, and sort of we're calling this the visitor area. This is the uh, library and archive. So visitors were coming to um, check out, you know, reading material or doing research. They would enter here, so this would be a main entrance. Uh, public can do research. They can sit here. Um, this area would be closed off to the public. However, you know, public members would be able to, you know, ask for certain documents. Um, again, these are for the archives of sensitive material, but so this would all be stacking units. So it's put us two parts. You know, we do have a restroom. Uh, this is a mechanical room, um, and this is generally the first floor uh, layout. Where's the next page? Oh, second page. <laughs> so now getting to the second floor. Um, we are moving the offices over, so the second floor in both buildings also serve as more of a, you know, private workspace for um, employees and staff. Um, it's not zooming in. Forgive me. Anyway, um, so each of these offices here would be dedicated to the Department of Cultural and Historic Affairs, the State County Historical Society, a common space, workspace, and then a boardroom. So there's obviously a lot of meetings that can that go on between the different organizations and entities, and obviously outside partners would be able to use the space as well. And then the second floor of the archives, um, items that necessarily won't be as accessible to the public would go on to the second floor. There would be no lift in this building, um, so which is why there's only stairs here, and then this becomes more of a private space, not accessible to the public at all. Uh, this building, however, which is important to note, and I forgive me, I forgot to mention it in the last slide, I'll go back, is we are adding a lift right over here. So you can see there is a lift to this floor for, you know, whether it's employees or if there's certain visitors meeting of uh, staff, they can go upstairs. This building will not because the idea is the first floor would be only accessible to the public. I just want to look at that. So the next three slides is just a general uh, rendition of the archives and visitor center. Um, this is what potentially, you know, the grounds would look like with full planting and lighting that I mentioned. So you would be driving in. You have the carriage house here. This is sort of a side angle elevation. Again, um, we, you know, we want it to be very visitor friendly. This would be the rear addition. Um, these are not, I, I will admit, that these are not the pavers that we are, uh, that is in our application and in our plans. They're more like brick pavers or smaller in scale. The site furnishing, I, we do not have um, entirely specced out just yet. They're a little similar than this, um, but, you know, the trees are uh, where they are. So it's important, um, this view, especially visually, to look at it. Um, and if you've looked at the plans, so we are keeping this addition that was done um, by the Sheriff's Department with the two bays. So the two bays um, will be infilled with windows to create an open space. Um, the brick will be cleaned and packed repair where possible. Um, this area right here in the rendition is where we have some brick deficiencies, which again is the historic um, portion of Lambert's carriage house. Um, we're going to do our best to um, repair where we can, along with uh, this building. 
So this is, and kind of you can see out here, the, the ancillary building is, is mostly brick. So all of it, again, will be repaired and restored where possible and repointed. Um, so this image here just kind of shows a rendition of that multi-use space. Um, the interior, we are, um, you know, it's going to have, you know, drop-down screens, sound system, so that presentations and meetings can be held uh, in this room. So with that, um, I, I would like to open up to questions if anyone has questions um, about, you know, the, the carriage house. Um, but, and actually, just before that, again, um, I just want to stress that we're going to salvage and preserve most of the exterior, um, the finishing of the exterior will conform to the Secretary of Interior standards. Um, we're, you know, basing it off historic images that we have of the carriage house, going back to the front page. Um, we're going to do the best we can with the brownstone. Um, all original openings will, um, you know, we'll, we'll put those back. Um, to, um, in incorporate historic finishes on the inside. Um, and that's it. So, we'd actually like to open the floor up for questions for Kelly. If you raise your hand, Gianfranco will call on you. So, Gianfranco, if you see any hands raised from any of the commissioners, please let us know. I see uh, Commissioner Tate. Go ahead. Commissioner Tate? Sorry, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? No. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Definitely better. Okay, perfect. Okay, so... If you go to the um, the image of uh, the carriage house facing north, the, the rendition, it was one of the last few slides that you did. It's the one with the uh, County of the Sake entry. I think it's in there, right there, exactly. So my question for you is why, um, you know, there might be a reason why. Why are the bricks at the Ashler um, infill different why why doesn't it blend in a little bit better not only at the window but if you look at the side of the building you know i know this is a rendering and it's it's not you know intended to be exact but just for just for sake of the sake of you know understanding the accuracy of what your intentions are do you plan to use a brick that kind of weaves back in to that existing fabric in a more intentional way that blends the brick, or do you want to do you want to sort of celebrate those punch outs with a different material? You notice the orange. No, I, sorry, we're, uh, continue. I, I didn't mean to cut you. No, no problem. If you look at the the two windows, right, the two square windows, right, with the the, the brick headers. And if you look at the side of the building where the, the fingers of the ashlar inter, uh, uh, intersect with the brick, you notice the orange brick versus the historic, you know, brown ashlar, right? Is there a reason why yeah. they're not, they're not um, sort of harmonious in color? Did, did you want their, I mean, I know this is a rendering, and, and renderings can be deceiving at times. Is the intention to, yeah. to, to separate that? Do you want that, that punch out to be... Uh, sort of uh, accentuated, or will that be sort of blended in with the Ashland brick look? Our intention is for it to be blended in as it is. Well, I, now currently it's painted red. Okay. Um, which I don't know who who made that decision. So our intent is to take the paint off, and okay. it's the paint like. And when we're in the field, it's the. Um, you know, if it's once of, you know, we do, you know, kind of like uh, concept or, you know, sketch out um, uh, exam mock ups. There you go, mock ups. <laughs> uh, if the paint doesn't come off, we're going to have to, you know, look for guidance to blend it in, whether we'll paint it a similar color to um, the brownstone. Right, 
right, or right. not. But I'm, I, I would look forward to, you know, recommendations. Right. Just, just, just from a visual perspective and this presentation, I mean, in terms of space planning and mapping, it all makes sense, and the circulation that you guys have um, sort of come up with makes complete sense. For me, it's just, you know, this is probably a simple exercise, but I'm just wondering, does that orange brick that's surrounding the opening need to be accentuated the way that's represented at the edge? No, it does not, and that's not our intent. Okay, okay. That's I just wanted to clarify that. That was my only question. Okay. Well thank you very much for, for uh, clarifying that. I think it should blend in with the ground cell is my recommendation. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Kelly? You and Franco, do you see any other hands raised? Uh, no, I do not. Any other commissioners would like to ask questions? Do we want to ask um, if, if there's any uh, public members who want to ask questions? Yes, is there any public members that have any questions? We'll do it right now. Well, what we, I'd have to do is um, read the number and, and so forth. Should I do that? Yes. I will get five minutes. Two. Okay. So, uh, I just got a message telling me that no one is uh, no one is calling in, but we would like to uh, invite uh, members of the public to call in if you have questions for this application uh, now that we're we have the presentation completed and it's on the screen the number to call is 973-321-1579 and then you'll need to put in the access number 711-680-0071 so this phone number and the access number is also vi uh, viewable at the City of Patterson uh, website. If you go to the main page, pattersonnj.gov, at the bottom of the main page, there will be a calendar of events, and you can click on the HPC meeting, and it will take you to another page that will have the number and the login information. If you ask questions, we're going to wait uh, two minutes while you uh, call in, and um, we'll uh, we'd like to hear from you if you have questions. Thank you. Please note the time is 721. Yeah, this is Rich. I just want to apologize for uh, being late. I had some technical difficulties with my internet. Let the record show that Richard Walter joined the meeting at 7 p.m. Uh, the record will reflect that.
Okay, the time is uh, 724. Uh, receive, I received a message that no one has called in, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair Virgo. So, thank you, Kelly, for your presentation. I would like to have a motion to on the floor to discuss this um, presentation of the resolution as well. Do I have a motion? Looks like Joyce is um. Looks like Joyce is also um. Yeah, I did not. Uh, I did not mute it. I meant to. I meant to motion it. Yes. And Walter, are you second? Okay, I'll second it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, due to absence. The vote of Commissioner 1, Maribel Garcia Leon, will be uh, uh, collected. We have a motion and a second. It's on the floor and it's open for discussion. The motion is on the floor. We'll take the vote at the end after discussion. Okay. Thank you, Chair, for your clarification. Sure. So, Commissioner, no um, uh, this is uh, for approval. This is a design review. That, that Kelly just presented to us. Do you guys have any feedback for this that you guys want to discuss about? Uh, Joyce would like to make a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Kelly for the presentation. I, I just think it's a really exciting project and I'm looking forward to seeing it through. And I think it's just wonderful that the archives and the meeting room are going to be put in place. It will add to the destination of our historic district here, and it also go hands in hand with the great uh, visitor center in Great Falls, and truly make this a historic destination for research and learning. I'm excited. Thank you. Commissioner Walter. Yeah, I just uh, I just said what I was going to say, so I'll get over. Commissioner Kate. Uh, I just wanted to sort of echo uh, the uh, 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 information of our uh, water. Can't hear you. Uh, and we'll have the arts. Can't hear you. I don't know why my phone is uh, giving giving issues. Better. Okay, now we can hear you. I just wanted to echo uh, Commissioner Corbo and Commissioner Walter's sentiment. I think it's a much better. Uh, Utilization of the program in that space, the way that the, the, uh, the layout is brought through. I think the finishes and the articulation of, of the site plan, as well as the, the, the layout, all the things, and uh, I'm, I'm, you know, excited for to open this into a um, part. Commissioner Wiley. Uh, yes, I'd like to um, uh, say I appreciate the efforts. Uh, this is a multi-million dollar, multi-stage project. Regrettably, it's a shame that with all of the aesthetics and moving employees to other buildings, the uh, main building still is going to have those big uh, HVAC systems lighting the right-hand side of the building, and it's regrettable. That with all of this moving around, there was no alternative for the aesthetics of the entire site. That's my only comment. So Commissioner Tate, do you have your hand up again? It's okay, up. down. Okay. Anyone else want to make a comment? Discussion? Okay, can I say a few things? Yes, Jeff. Yeah, okay, so the uh, I don't believe that Kelly mentioned it, but uh, the project is being funded by um, a grant, a multi-year grant uh, from the New Jersey Historic Trust. And as we know, their uh, guidelines are, of course, that the projects will be very well watched over with regard to preservation review. Uh, the New Jersey Trust and the HPO, the Historic Preservation Office at the state level, 
uh, will both be receiving uh, project authorization applications from uh, Passaic County uh, on the plans and all of the uh, preservation treatments for uh, for this project. Uh, so similar to the uh, high level of integrity that the uh, castle and the ancillary buildings have uh, that was demonstrated on the uh, presentation tonight, uh, we expect that this uh, project will be carried out and specified in accordance with the Secretary of Interior standards, which are the same standards that we also uh, maintain here at the local level. Uh, one thing that we also do is uh, take a look at the issuance of permits uh, for the building and uh, like with other projects, uh, we also tend to pass a resolution uh, with the condition that the staff here at HPC, myself and Tim, are involved in certain aspects of the project to help maintain and um, uh, kind of certify the uh, choices in the field. For example, uh, mortar mock-ups and, you know, one of the um, situations that Kelly mentioned in the presentation had to do with the paint removal. Uh, someone decided to take all this uh, brownstone and paint it red some, some years ago, and it's always very sad uh, when this happens because with that was more than one application, you know, in our downtown where uh, stone buildings are painted, and it's uh, really really difficult to, to deal with getting the paint off those buildings uh, to restore them back to their um, their intended state. So there's going to be a need for uh, for experimentation, uh, specification of uh, in the field of methodology and certain um, uh, uh, like cleaners and chemicals, uh, for example, to accomplish this. So I recommend that the uh, the resolution that you pass be conditioned upon sort of the normal set of oversight by the staff where with regard to uh, colors, uh, choices, uh, uh, methodology for paint removal, um, also for uh, mortar and brick and, and uh, masonry unit replacement. So we get to um, kind of help help the uh, project kind of take its form. Um, the other the other uh, uh, topic I'd like to mention is the uh, the site work that's shown here in the plans in the rendering the last few slides is a departure from the current authentic um, site configuration. So what I mean is I want everyone to be aware of this so that if there's any you know commentary about it, we can bring it out here because the the state um, preservation office will be looking, you know, at our minutes and, you know, the comments that we make. So I wanted to make sure that this was um, something that we discussed in a little more detail. The photo on screen now that Kelly's showing you is the historic, you know, retaining wall with the, um, that shows the entrance to the castle. But then uh, towards the end, if, you know, the site plan uh, showed you that there was going to be a straight access um, pedestrian access was going to be provided, which doesn't exist today, uh, between the main castle and uh, the ancillary uh, building. So this this is a screen that's on, the slide that's on screen demonstrates the proposal. You see it's a very straight set of pavers, and this allows for uh, people to uh, make a, a very strong visual connection between and a physical connection between the main building and the uh, uh, visitor center area. Um, also, the the entranceway and uh, you can like bringing your vehicle toward the building will be simplified and made very uh, direct. So people will, I think, know where they're going when it comes to um, driving into the site uh, for the first time uh, if you've never been there. There's also in this slide, you can see there's a large, uh, a lot of pavers being added to the front of the building, as well as to the plaza in the back. Uh, this is also a departure from uh, current conditions and, and is not a necessarily authentic. Uh, this is uh, not a treatment that existed as far as we know. And in order to accomplish what you see on screen, the 
position of the massive stone block retaining wall needs to be moved. So the stone block retaining wall starting at about where the cursor is, right about there, all the way toward the ancillary building will have to, will, will actually be to the left. So starting, um, starting where the cursor was and to the left, the retaining, the block retaining wall will be removed and then the embankment will be cut a bit and then uh, the stone blocks, you know, put back. Uh, they'll actually, in, in the case of, in this case, need to add stone blocks because the grade will actually change a bit when this happens. So this will be a departure from the, um, from the current landscape and uh, authentic conditions. So th this is one of the you know, changes that I think um, adds a lot of functionality and connectivity to uh, this project overall, and that's why it's being suggested. There's also lighting, as you saw in the rendering, um, going into the uh, along the walkway, which is also a very um, thoughtful and advantageous. And it seems like the the roundabout, the drop off, for example, for um, uh, people with disabilities is also being um, thought and you know, well thought about. So if you like this configuration, then, you know, you can accept it as is. But I wanted to point out that um, this is a departure from the authentic uh, uh, configuration of the retaining wall and the landscape. It, I, think, I think I would call it a slight uh, change as opposed to a major change. And they are adding um, elements that makes, makes these um, uh, makes the site plan sort of work in a more functional, uh, modern way uh, that departs from uh, the authentic conditions. Certainly, there's a lot of asphalt right now, and uh, the site is a little bit hard to understand. Like the first set of photos, it's very difficult to sort of follow where all these spaces are. But we did conduct a site visit and made a lot of sense. Uh, I would just like to let the commissioners know that after visiting uh, the site and looking at it carefully for myself, um, I think all of the suggestions made make a lot of sense. The removal of the large uh, 1980s brick building in the rear is definitely a necessity. And the repurposing of the upstairs and downstairs spaces, focusing on these two buildings, which are really the historic of, uh, buildings that remain, um, is really a, a, a thoughtful and, and, well, and well done. Uh, and will, will be a, a major compliment to uh, the site, and as Commissioner Corvo said, uh, make it, making it a real destination for uh, public in the future, uh, for researchers, school groups, uh, will really expand the um, the accessibility to a variety of different uh, groups uh, that you know may may never have visited before. So I think it's a, a, a great plan. Uh, we need to be involved with the work. I want to ask a question. Um, I didn't look carefully at the at window choices, but um, I wonder if it would be allowed for us to ask um, Kelly to make comments about windows because no comments were made about windows in the presentation. We could uh, ask Kelly. Kelly, could you make a comment on the windows? Yes, Karen. Um, and I did hear, I wasn't sure if you were asking Romina if I could speak or not. <laughs> um, so we are replacing all of the window openings. Um, as you sort of see in this historic rendering, there'll be wood windows. And it's two over two. Oh. And they look like they're all double hung, is that right? Correct. <laughs> And the windows in the rear of the building, like on the side, will also be wood windows, or are they going to be different? We're proposing wood. Right. Okay, excellent. We're trying to show another um, side with a view of it. Yeah, so there would be wood windows. Okay, thank and you. And smaller openings, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so all window openings will remain intact and in, in their historic positions. Um, on, on the other building, we've heard about it, uh, w a windows and openings that were filled in. Can you just leave it on the slide for a moment? Um, uh, and 
and, and that's really a huge benefit where all of the um, openings will remain intact and those that actually were uh, filled in in the past will be brought um, brought back. The, the windows will be put back in those openings. This slide is uh, a reminder of the red painted uh, color that um, I was commenting about. And um, this will, you know, they're, they're seeking to remove this paint, and it's a major, a major project to do so. Uh, so those are my recommendations. Uh, again, in my comments, I think it's an outstanding project, and I think um, I, have, I have great uh, uh, expectation that this will, will be done in, in, uh, to the highest preservation standards based on the funding stream as well as the reviewability um, of the uh, of the project and the, uh, the the county really needs to be again congratulated, commended, and thanked for these investments um, in these ancillary buildings that have been really kind of run down um, by their use at the motor pool for all these years. Uh, this will be a much much higher, better use for these buildings going forward. Thank you. Looks like uh, Commissioner Wiley has a comment. Commissioner Wiley? Yes, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Oh, uh, yes, I would just like to uh, ask one brief thing. I didn't hear any mention about the roof. And I know this is a reuse of, in fact, even the, where the garage doors are will be retrofitted. But is this uh, a, a historically, it was always, I guess, a flat roof? I didn't hear any conversation about the roof. Uh, Kelly, would you want to make um, uh, tell us about the roof like you did about the windows? Kelly? Kelly, can you hear us? Hi, Mom. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you now. Um, yes, the roof was historically flat, um, probably not a roof top that you see uh, today, um, but we are going to be replacing it in a similar um, material, and it will be flat. What we're proposing. We're proposing to replace it in in kind. Commissioner Commissioner Wiley. Commissioner Wiley. Joanne, you're on mute. Yes. Can Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry if that makes up. Uh, yes, my question, I don't know if there was going to be a parapet or some kind of addition, but it's just like kind. And uh, thank you very much for clearing that up, Kelly. Okay. And Jeffrey, if we don't see any more questions from any of the commissioners. No more, no more questions, Mr. Chairman. So far, one of the conditional approval would be that we would want to get. Um, the client to have director approval or staff approval on color or material that will be used throughout the project. Is there any other conditions that we have to add? Before we can get a motion on the floor for approval of the resolution? Can I get a motion to approve? Yeah, we have the motion on. We have the motion is already on the floor. So all you have to do is call for a roll call. Okay. Um, can we get a roll call with the conditional approval that um, the director will be consulted for any approval on color or material from the client? Roll call, please. Can I? Can I? Uh, I just want to interject for a second. I'm sorry. I've had my hand raised. Oh, I didn't see it. Sorry. 
That's okay. It's, it's color, material, but also the testing, removal, and experimentation of the procedures that you mentioned. That should be included as well. Just to be clear. <laughs> color, material, and the removal of the materials. Any experimental methodology? Any experimental methodology on the materials? Got it. Can I get a roll call? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, due, due to absence, the vote of alternate commissioner one, Garcia Leon, will be, uh, the, her vote will be collected. Commissioner Garcia Leon. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. Commissioner Wiley. Yes. Commissioner Redmond. Commissioner Walter. Commissioner Simpson. Yes. Vice Chair Rafael. Uh, she, she's recused. Chair Ahmed. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Kelly. We will now move ahead to item number four in the agenda committee reports that are aid towards an event. Joanne, I mean, Jennifer, could you please put up the report that you, I mean, Joanne has given you first for the towards an events committee? Oh, uh, yes. Give me a moment to get it out. I don't have it right here. Hold on. No problem. And then Joanne, um, you you will be given that part as soon as you. Yes, no. Hopefully, we can get you out before you have to leave. Okay, can you see it on screen now? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Um, okay, yes. great. Scroll a little down. Your friend. Okay. All right. Uh, sure. All right. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is a, a, a two-pronged report. Uh, I don't know if you have the opportunity to last the first page of the report. Uh, is focused on uh, the suggested awardees and their status. The second page of the report deals with the question of an annual awards dinner and consideration. So starting with page one, um, I would like if John Franco, would you be able to show photos about the suggested awardees that the committee has brought forward to the commission? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, is this the time you want me to do that? Why don't you do it now? Uh, because it, is it possible that as you bring them forward, uh, the five, you could tell them which one we're looking at and why it has merit? Because, commissioners, this is a very intriguing list. It's a broad group of categories, but non-categories that are, that are participated in an area as new construction. So uh, the committee uh, devoted significant time under the guidance of our director about the strengths of them and why they hold merit. Uh, I would like to mention that in the paragraph preceding my comments on this, I indicated that the merits were not time sensitive. And the reason I said that is that in the second part of this meeting, uh, my committee meeting, we may be talking about the when or if of an annual awards dinner. And so the idea was that these uh, suggested awardees will stand the test of time. And so if they are delayed and we don't know, uh, they have merit. So it's not expiring, in other words. So, John Franco, I'll turn it over to you if you could share uh, what, uh, why these were bring, brought forward to the uh, commission. Yes, 
Thank you, uh, Joanne. Okay. Uh, we we have um, we we have a list that you saw in the committee report of a good variety of uh, projects that are either done or um, are very close to being done uh, for for the fall and uh, for our uh, annual awards uh, event. We usually start to bring forward um, for your uh, review projects that are either done or close to being done for the awards uh, for the annual awards that are in the fall. We start bringing that to to, to you now in June or July, um, and we ask you to consider uh, perhaps adopting uh, the candidates or some of them, so that you know we have a chance to reach out to the owners. Um, to offer them, you know, an award and invite them to come to the event. That's usually how we do it. So I'm just going to go through some of these uh, projects and tell you just a, a little bit about them. This is in the Eastside Park Historic District on East 37th Street. Um, we're all familiar with this building. This is the building that um, a year ago we started to interact with the new owners in their effort to salvage this building from very poor existing conditions after it had been left um, vacant and empty and there was significant water infiltration and um, mold in the building. It was, it was really needed a lot of work. The, um, the new owner uh, intention of moving his family in and really is the situation of you know, having having fallen in love with the house and wanted to put the uh, labor and, and effort into and the expense into its rehabilitation. Um, Tim and I recently made this site visit where you see this photo. Um, the building is looking great. All of the siding on the exterior was preserved. You know that the you already know the roof was replaced with asphalt is one of the first things that we discuss with the new owner. Uh, the uh, columns that you see uh, are uh, composite. These are replacement columns. And you can see that the windows have also been rehabilitated and are left in their authentic um, configuration. These are the original windows. So we were very excited to learn when we were at the project that um, not only did he leave the, well, he, he, he was, uh, he was, he needed to leave all the front windows as authentic and, and, uh, rehabilitate them. But the side windows, the commission had provided a, a approval for their replacement, um, with a, with an aluminum product. Uh, he actually replaced very few of the windows, uh, went around the building after he had some experience with working with the front and maintained the historic windows, um, around the house. Uh, so only some of the windows have been replaced. This is another view from the side. This is a very unique piece of architecture um, and a very um, uh, beautiful building in the Eastside Park Historic District. You can see that the landscaping is just starting to be improved as well. Um, and this is uh, a candidate for uh, exemplary rehabilitation of a residential building. This is a category that we used to have a lot of candidates in year after year, uh, but in the past, I'd say three to four years, we haven't had uh, candidates. So uh, we really would like to appreciate the good work that the commission did with the applicant and that the applicant has invested in this um, in this property and bringing his, um, his family to, to Patterson. So this is uh, East 37th Street. I may have to, uh, okay, I can go right to this one. This is a down, in the downtown commercial historic district. This project was reviewed uh, some time ago by the commission. You can see that it's really moving along. Um, it had stayed uh, dormant for a while because of the removal of asbestos inside, asbestos containing materials inside the building. But once that was all cleaned, cleaned up, uh, they got right into uh, the exterior uh, work. We have been working with um, the owner is the Passaic County Community College, and the building is going to be made into a, a work training area. Um, it's, a, it's sort of a new program that they're bringing into the college, and it's a new 
building that they're adopting in the downtown. As you know, the, the community college has adopted many historic buildings in the downtown and it does a good job of taking care of them and, and, and rehabilitating them. You can see the beautiful color of the blonde brick has been cleaned and restored uh, to a very appealing appearance. And uh, we just looked at mock-up, uh, mock-ups for uh, the dental. Some of them are uh, cracked and falling, and they're going to be replaced. Um, the terracotta work that's here at the cornice line will be, of course, repointed, completely repointed. And the windows will be uh, will be all replaced with uh, an aluminum win- an aluminum um, window. These doors and openings we've just reviewed uh, as well, they'll be replaced. Some of them will actually be like a a faux door. Uh, They will be used as uh, entrances. I'm I'm speaking about the one over here, really. This one will be an entrance. Um, And the the bay doors will also be left as uh, as entrances, and they will be um, um, replaced and built in in, in, in wood. This is also um, an exemplary building. Uh, rehabilitation in the downtown commercial district for a public use as opposed to um, a commercial use. So we we did uh, honor the police headquarters last year, and this is the fire headquarters. Now, how cool is that? I have to jump out of this and go back to my um, other screen to show you a couple of others. Can you see uh, what's on screen? Yes. Okay. So this photo is taken at the corner of Washington and Van Houten Streets. So the the fire station building that you just saw would be directly to your right. So you can see this uh, this this church, the Second Baptist Church church here, uh, right adjacent to the church is the fire station building. Uh, this is the view from the Greenbaum's corner looking down Washington Street toward Broadway. This is the subject building on the corner. You can see that it's under rehabilitation at this time when the photo was taken. This building, I've been looking for the original uh, photo of this building. You wouldn't even believe it if I showed it to you. I, I couldn't find one in time for the meeting, but I really hope I find the original condition. It was painted blue um, with kind of like paint splattered all over it. It had a, a kind of a boxy parapet wall. Um, all of these windows were closed up, uh, boarded over, and the new owner um, came under a, a preservation guidance, removed all of the um, 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 the windows that had been uh, the the windows that had been boarded over. Uh, we approved windows to be installed, commercial style windows for apartments upstairs. And this is now going to be a restaurant down in this corner. Uh, this project is just about completed now. I noticed that it was completed with its entablature and its cornice done in fiberglass, as well as uh, the awning that's placed here to cover the rolling gates and a new storefront system and another retail space. This is a fabulous little project that started from nothing, and the uh, the owner and his brother um, repointed the building uh, and went through the entire preservation process over you know a period of time, sort of doing it a little bit at a time. It's been a great it's a great success story. So um, I'm going to show you a couple more of these um, photos. Again, this is sort of when the building was still in process, and it really does look uh, look very good now. These are all taken at the same time, so um, I don't have one of its current condition, but this would be another uh, likely candidate. I could go back and open up another uh, folder. This is uh, 150 Main Street. This building is directly uh, next door to the Quackenbush building on the corner of uh, Ellison and Maine. And something that is just so unique about this project is the installation of 
this fiberglass cornice. This is the first time um, in the district that the a, a precast fiberglass cornice was added to a building that had lost its cornice. The cornice was gone. Um, and it, there was a time when we used to draw out and, and build a new cornice out of wood and out of moldings and sort of make one to uh, put back up. This one is uh, ordered from um, sort of out of a collection of a catalog, much like these cornices were when these buildings were first erected um, historically. So I wanted to show you another uh, couple of photos of, of, see, here we go. So this is them putting the staging and the framing up for the second cornice, also made out of fiberglass, and you can see the completed a large cornice on top, uh, new windows, and the building has been like kind of repointed and then and then painted. It was already painted, and the brick was painted and painted over again. These are new window units here. This building, this project is completed, and it's occupied today. This these pictures are uh, it, but it's still underway. You can see half of the cornice is installed here. Uh, this is owned by the Hannon brothers, who uh, also have, as their first sort of experiment with the fiberglass cornice, they did this small building, which is right around the corner from the one I showed you. This is actually right next door to Ellison Pizza on Ellison Street. Ellison Pizza is right off to the right side of this building. And um, this uh, is, a, is a great little project, which established an apartment upstairs. You can see the aluminum multi, um, multi-light windows that were uh, replaced. And this is also a fiberglass cornice and breeze panel. So both of these uh, buildings would go on the same um, award, in my opinion. I have one more address to show you. So this is the new charter school building that's underway in an in a adaptive reuse um, at uh, the Morris Street location. Uh, we did a lot of review of this, uh, of this project as a way of activating this uh, storage building and building in the, um, in order for it to um, have the opportunity to go into reuse as a school. So uh, these, Doors and windows were all very carefully uh, designed and mocked up. They're actually all custom built. Um, these are uh, the, the, the buildings of original use, of course, is a storage building for materials. And uh, hence, these are loading doors uh, where material could be uh, loaded into the various floors through these doors. Uh, so these are uh, faux doors. Um, they act as windows on the inside of the space. They don't actually open but they're all uh, made out of uh, wood and uh, they're on both the front and the back of the building. Um, these are double hung windows that are inoperable. Um, and you can see that the parking lot now is kind of taking shape and the sidewalk in front of the building. So this is where uh, there was the machine shop, the long machine shop that was demolished as part of this project to create a parking area. And in the rear, where my cursor is, is where the gymnasium, the new gymnasium building will go. Um, it's it's uh, not there yet. That's still uh, to be built. Uh, this perspective shows, well, there's the sidewalk that's being worked on. Uh, we are getting this, the same slates are being reset, if you recall. And here at the loading dock in the rear of the building it acts as sort of the main entrance to the uh, school. Uh, this is going to re receive a, a brick of veneer, and the same brick will be used uh, for the, or the same full brick will be used for the uh, facade of the uh, gym building. So this is also taking shape. Uh, there's an ADA ramp that's now installed here. And uh, the main entrance sort of into the lobby will be through the doors here. Uh, let's see if I have 
Uh, this is like a, a view a looking up above the, uh, the loading dock, again, showing the, um, the loading doors that were constructed um, and, the other, and the windows. Uh, I thought this was pretty remarkable. This is the uh, mock-up review for the thin brick and the, uh, and the mortar. So this is the sampling, and, they, and it's like a dead ringer. I thought you'd probably like to, um, to see that. So the Morris Street Adaptive Reuse, um, you know, really was an ambitious project that brought the complex back into um, a sort of uh, use for uh, that complements the school across the street and um, you know, the the other part of the project that we approved facing Grand Street uh, several years ago. We also offered uh, an award to. So this is another project that is supposed to be ready for occupancy in the fall, and they're moving along quite well with this. So this could this could be another candidate. Adapted reuse of a uh, of a of a uh, industrial building or a mill building. So that that concludes my presentation for you. Uh, thank you, John Franco. Um, Commissioners, uh, the committee from the animals, as you see in the notes, in the uh, mints, and uh, we would like to bring forward this list of candidates to receive awards and recognition at an annual awards dinner as yet on uh, no schedule. We'd like to do that, and uh, John Frank will have to ask you, is it the correct form for us to ask questions and then ask for a motion to accept, or what is the procedure? I'm not sure. So typically we have a resolution. Um, if you would like, uh, you can direct me, you can pass a motion directing me to prepare a resolution and then we'll have one for next meeting. All right. Um, commissioners, are there any questions or I would like to direct uh, council to draft a resolution course signing law to be presented at the next HPC commission meeting? Are we all right with that? All right, um, do you draft a resolution? Sorry, Joanne, I didn't understand you. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, my question was, uh, uh, if the commissioners have no no questions, I would like to ask you to draft the resolution for the commission for the next HPC meeting for these yes. awardees. Yeah, this is Rich. I do have a question. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, Rich, I couldn't understand any of that. Okay. The second one, which is. Sandy Williams House. Yes. I think we should change that to say the name of the new owner, not Sandy Williams House. That might be insulting to the new owner. As I'm, I'm sure that when the uh, actual resolution comes forward, those uh, those things will be described absolutely accurately, and your point is well taken. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Can we go on to page two? Are, are we all together now on this? On page two of the um, report, uh, there are several uh, comments I'd like to mention that the committee talked about at length, all related to uh, the general concerns for safety, health and safety, not specific to our award dinner, but specific to the general idea of the when and the how of coming together in health and safety. And the second the second page has some paragraphs which you don't have to read now, but the first one simply reiterates our important role for why we have uh, our annual awards dinner and why we recognize people for their specific uh, successes and what each success brings to the cumul cumulative well-being of the city. 
uh, the second and third paragraphs basically talk about the idea that there are requirements for social distancing uh, and any ve venue, including the brownstone, would have uh, concerns about that which would have to be met. Uh, and uh, then there are, might be exploring other opportunities for how we have a, a, a gathering or not. And uh, then at the end of this, I bring forward what probably is the most important part, and that is the committee is asking the commission for this. Commissioners, each of us may, and I say may because no one can speak for anyone else, have concerns about the particular safety uh, in this uh, concerns that we all have with what's frequently referred to as COVID-19. So our uh, idea was to bring forth a discussion period, uh, which, and you can see the last part of page two is, and the commission may, of course, defer all discussion and have nothing this evening. It may have discussion this evening and defer decision-making to another time, or it may hold discussion and call for decision at this meeting. The committee, uh, after we spoke for over an hour, and it was a very strong and informative meeting, uh, brought forward the idea that we would like to open up the, the question of the when, the when of an annual awards dinner, because we are sure there's going to be one, but we don't know if it's 2020, with which the brownstone, and John Franco may jump in on this, because he had dialogue with Mr. Manzo, or in 2021. So I will, at this point, open it up for questions or ideas from the commissioners on this very important question about when or if to hold an annual awards uh, dinner this year or next year. Are there any, I can't see the screen, so uh, perhaps, uh, Mr. Chairman, you can direct me on this and help with this. So, Jim Ringo, if you see anyone raising hands, then we could, um, then you could just call on them. Uh, as for me, my opinion would be I would prefer if the annual dinner is not in this year. Um, I have a strong feeling that this year it won't even have a strong, um, there might not be a strong presence as well due to safety reasons, due to COVID. So that is my opinion. Um, does any of the other comments have any other input for jo Joanne? Yes, Chairman. This is Kenny Tyson. Yes. Um, can we think about maybe doing a, a virtual um, awards dinner instead of a um, sit-down dinner? And that way we can advertise it and maybe even put it on Channel 77 so everyone can see and highlight the, all the work that's been done this year. Uh, yes, if I can answer Ken on that, uh, Commissioner Simpson. Yes, uh, some of the conversation we had was for current and alternative ways to do a few things. One, a timely recognition of these awardees in close in proximity to when they really did their project. And then a an annual awards dinner, perhaps at a later time or in 2021, uh, where we can still reference them, uh, some such, but a little bit of thinking outside the box. And, and we, we can discuss something about it, but of course, could make no decision. Is there anyone else? Uh, Richard Walter. Richard Walter. So, so, sorry, go ahead. I'm trying to respond. Uh, uh, yes, I, I'm going to anything this year at all. We can't hear you, Richard. Am I, am I muted? We can't hear you, Richard. Uh, I don't know what's going on. I'm not muted. Uh, a little bit closer to your phone. Uh, I'm about four inches away from it right now. Uh, okay, we can hear you. It's just a little low, that's all. Okay, but anyway, uh, everything, every other organization I belong to has canceled everything for this year. And I think we should cancel anything this year. And started fresh in 2021. Okay, thank you. And did you have a comment in the I, 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 yeah. I'm not here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I, I like, I, 
theory. I like the idea of the bird, but I, I think we should hold it off and say, I think right now, people are focused on the upcoming election. So I do agree with the other commissioners to postpone it to 2021. I just want to make one more comment. Uh, the Ken's idea of doing a virtual event might not be bad if we wanted to do it for 2020. So maybe we could actually have a lot more viewers. We could advertise on Facebook um, and just get a lot of people's attention so they could actually see these. Um, similar to what Jim Franco showed, all the projects um, um, and on Zoom or WebEx, and they can see it. So if we really did want to do it for 2020, I think the committee should look into the virtual as an idea. And at the end of the day, it is, it is based on the committee's decision on uh, the way that we would do it. And Chairman, also, we can put it on, we can put it on public access. Yep. Yeah. Just one more thing. A little bit of a flavor for our 2021 to hopefully get a better reception. You get out to more people if you just do a Facebook Live. Yeah. 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 Any type of virtual that is. Yep. Richard, uh, Richard, we can we can do both. We can do we can do Facebook Live and we can do um we can, we can do a channel seven seven. So we can try to figure out how we can incorporate both into. Yeah, you can do Facebook Live I, and keep that recording and have it put on the TV. Uh, can I interject something here? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Okay, I'd like, to, I'd like to interject something just in the benefit of time. There seems to be a consensus that phys a physical dinner this year, uh, several of the commissioners, but not everyone, had weighed in about the idea of referring to an in-person dinner to 2021. Um, I would like to ask the question whether or not it's correct protocol, just like to get a sense of this. Is there any commissioner who is firm on the idea that let's have it this year as we approved it in the past? In other words, we had approved fall 2020. Are we canceling that decision uh, and delaying the dinner? Is that accurate? Yes, we're delaying the dinner, okay. and we should turn it into a virtual, okay. a virtual event. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Let's, let's just do one point at a time, just so I can get this straight. So the commission's sense is that we are going to defer it. We are going to cancel one that was previously done. And, and that opens up a question that, John Franco, I would like you to share what you did at the uh, meeting where you talked about the conversation with Mr. Manzo and use of the brownstone 
Uh, give us two or three minutes of, of that circumstance so the commissioners know that we could delay without penalty. Yes, I, I just want to say that Kelly uh, wanted to speak. She's in town telling me she needs to say something. And oh, okay. Kelly, are you there? Do you want to, before I go, go ahead, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Oh, perfect. I don't like that. Um, and this is before, keep in mind, this is before Joanne's questioning. My my input would be if we're going to postpone until spring, let's say, we can still do a virtual sort of maybe like overlook of all the awardees in the fall like we usually do, right? Like if we award in the fall and maybe you could do a virtual thing in the fall and then have the actual dinner in the spring. As you know, sort of an outlook to, you know, us getting together to celebrate the awardees. That was my comment to add, but now I defer back to Joanne. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Kelly. And uh, I see where the committee is going with their outlook. Uh, I would like to um, go back to John Franco. You were starting to talk very briefly about uh, Mr. Manzo's comments about use of the facility, and we have no penalty if we cancel and go into the spring. I just want the commissioners to be aware of that. Okay, thank you, Joanne. Uh, I just want to mention before I start, though, um, um, Mohammed. Your your phone creates a tremendous amount of feedback, and I keep muting you, and you keep taking me off mute. I'm muting you because it's wrecking the meeting, all this feedback that your phone is giving. So please leave yourself on mute if I put you on mute so we can hear the comments that people are making. That's why I keep putting you on mute, because you're the, you're the microphone that's carrying all the feedback that people are hearing. So uh, I wanted to provide the commission with you know, as much information as I could about the dinner regarding, you know, do we have, a war, you know, potential candidates? And as I just demonstrated, we have um, several candidates in different uh, categories this year, which is really great uh, that we can, you know, we can choose from them or we can adopt them all as you see fit. But also when it came to the brownstone availability, I called into Mr. Manzo um, and, you know, as you know, we have a relationship with the Manzos over the years that we've been doing this. So, uh, of course, he's always been very willing to accommodate us in, in a way that's um, uh, really beneficial to the way our event works with regard to collecting deposits and, uh, you know, making the final payment and so on. So, you know, I asked him what his perspective was about what um, the fall looks like. And he said to me that, well, certainly um, he expects that they will uh, be allowed to be open uh, and hosting events uh, under guidelines of not only the, the typical social distancing and um, uh, pers personal protection, masks, and so on, but also in capacity. So. He said, for example, if the Brownstone holds a thousand uh, people altogether, he may only be able to occupy the entire building with 250 people, which is 25% of, uh, of capacity uh, on any you know, given night. So, you know, our, our dinner is usually uh, somewhere between you know, uh, 70 and uh, 85 people. Uh, we have broken, you know, 100 once or twice, but we're generally just under 100 people. And he said what that would mean for an event like ours would, would be very little, be very little difference. Uh, he said that instead of 10 people at a 10-person at a table, we would have to spread out to be uh, seven or eight people at a table. And uh, the room, we would probably have a little more space in between tables. Um, and the room that we typically use would probably be adequate. So the, the question about whether the Brownstone could accommodate, a, you know, a, let's say all those people decided they wanted to come, you know, uh, he said they, he believed that they would be open for business with, uh, and our, our event would only be a slight difference. He also said that uh, he doesn't usually you know, he doesn't collect a deposit from us. We generally give him a head count a week or two before the event, and then we pay for the head count that we give him when he prepares, you know, food for that many people. Uh, so 
he encouraged me to go ahead and, you know, book the, book the evening. And if we didn't get enough turnout that was, you know, adequate, uh, then, you know, we wouldn't lose the deposit. Uh, so we could, you know, let him know several weeks in advance that we, you know, we just see that people are just not coming out. Uh, because the one thing that Mr. Manzo and, you know, me and, and all of you can't answer is, you know, what are people going to do? Like, um, what's their, are they going to be wanting to turn out in, in a social event, a dinner like this? Uh, are they confident to do that? Mr. Manzo said we can't really tell. If they're going to, they said for you, you know, for you, you know, we can we can tell you that the the risks of of organizing your event would be sort of you know minimized. So that's the information I wanted to um, provide to you in terms of uh, to think about, you know. John Franco. Yeah. Um, this is Kenny again, and that that's that's what I was trying to. Um, I agree exactly with what you said because we should really be thinking about doing something virtual as opposed to wasting our time trying to hope that 80 people will come or a little less than 80 people will come to a sit-down dinner when we have so many unknowns, when we can really start planning now for something that we can possibly do and get those same 80 people onto a virtual meeting when all we have to do is click a link from an email. Okay, thank you for your opinion. Yeah, I... Thank you. Um... I'm sorry, John Franco, were you speaking? I just wanted to answer Kenny. Uh, I'm, I'm opposed to a virtual uh, replacement of this event uh, with you know 80 people on a virtual meeting because it happens to be what we need to do. We, the idea of putting everybody in the room, having the event, it's just like you know what all of us are experiencing now. We can't see our friends, we can't see our families, we can't go sit down and, at a restaurant and enjoy each other's company. And that will be completely missing, and that really is the whole idea of having this event. Uh, every event that we've done was to organize uh, a time when people could gather and be together and feel the energy in the room, especially the people that we'd like to honor. We'd like to give them that feeling that comes from being seen, being watched, in, in the room where it happened, people applauding for them, standing up for them. And I, so I, I think that the event doesn't need to be held this year. if. It's going to be a virtual event. My opinion, I'm just that my opinion would be to not have the virtual event and postpone it to when we can have a certainty, like we used to, you know, have a certainty of people wanting to show up, and that will, I think, be the best service to our to our awardees. So that's okay. my opinion. All right, I'd like to I'd like to just uh, make a couple of comments to that. Um, there is a dynamic that comes forward when awardees are with awardees and uh, their companies are supporting them, et cetera. I am not in favor of a virtual meeting. Um, I think it's uh, interesting, but I think because of the unique characteristics of what this, uh, our dinners have, um, there's, I, I would, I'm sorry, there's a lot of noise. Okay. Hello. Sorry, that's me. Okay. Um, so I, I am not in favor of a, of a virtual meeting. Um, I think our efforts might be better used. And by the way, remember, we bought the uh, sound system, et cetera, last year. We invest, so we make best use of our money whenever we have it there. We don't have that DJ $400 loss uh, from that. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I would, I would like to uh, share that. Correct? This, um, John, can I also um, um, add another thing that sure. um, our, um, even our, our crowd is a much older crowd, so we're also introducing people to, in this climate, we don't, even next year, we may not even be able to still go outside or be able to be out, and we're asking our, our, our older our, our older people who, who actually um, contribute and, and help out and, um, and come out to these events to come to this event. I think we should also think about doing something else as a plan B. Well, I, I appreciate your comments for the safety, uh, health and safety issues. Um, but uh, I don't think we can come to, I, I, my, my own thought right now, just looking at the time, and, and this is a complex issue. I would like to ask the commission to consider deferring any final plan making, if that is the word, to our next meeting. So we have time to explore uh, what our thoughts are 
Uh, and it would be specifically this, a yes or no on 2020 in-person annual award center. I think we already know what that answer is, but I feel compelled to bring it to your attention to consider when you are not here. An annual awards dinner in 2021 held in person, uh, probably in the spring, it might be uh, eight months from now, et cetera. And um, uh, there's, there was uh, expression of interest on some form of non-in-person virtual thing, which as I say, um, uh, it's an intriguing thing. It might be an augmented uh, circumstance, augmenting uh, a loss of this for all, but I don't think it replaces a dinner. So uh, my comments were are that uh, if there are any other comments or thoughts, uh, we have an assignment for our attorney to do the resolution. So we will have these in hand. Um, and then we can, if it's okay with everyone, if there's a consensus here, then we come back, our committee will meet one more time before we have transitions coming up anyway, uh, and bring some thoughts forward. But um, that's what my that's what my ideas are. Um, uh, Chair, is is are we following along all right, or I'll close my my uh, my report. Can I ask you for some direct uh, on it? I have uh, one last uh, comment. This is William. This is uh, Commissioner Tate. Yes. So. so uh, I, I like the the concept of Kenny's virtual sort of with uh, Commissioner uh, Ruffel, Ruffels, this whole idea of doing a presentation to introduce what the projects are virtually. Yeah. But I think, I personally think that the awards ceremony, I'm specifically calling it ceremony, has to be in person because one of the, the big things about this event, this dinner that we've had, is the social interaction where the people get to talk to the commissioners, John Franco, and you know we, we all sort of connect on that level. And I think the digital aspect kind of completely removes that aspect from it. So I think if we did if we did a virtual sort of roundabout with everybody, and then I would even propose you know the virtual roundabout, and then in the future, if we wanted to keep it this year, maybe we could propose doing an outdoor thing with a projector or something like that. And then we can socially distance the people that way. You know, I, I'm just throwing out ideas if we really want to keep it 2020. And I was gonna say, well, if you think about it, we're um, when we're in this when we're in a sit-down dinner, we're watching a presentation of slides. Those presentation of slides can easily be done on the web on the web meeting is just like this meeting we're seeing right now. That's and then true. when you and then when we ask an applicant to speak, they can easily be heard if we have the IT making sure that he has those different individuals, the people who are awardees, the ability to um, to speak and be heard and be clear, and they can give their thank yous. I mean, we can think about we can make this kind of like the the actual ceremony, but but digitally. I mean, I don't see any difference than what we're actually doing right now. I'm thinking about the I'm thinking about the informal interactions between people. You know, like when you go up to someone asking questions and. They may ask you questions about the position and that kind of stuff. But I mean, if that's not a priority, then I can see, I can totally see a lot of questions on that. Okay, I'd like to make one other comment here. Um, I I absolutely feel that the that the uh, intangible, undefinable exchange uh, between awardees is the high point of the of that dinner. Uh, including uh, letting some of these awardees know what's happened in the past. And I specifically am thinking of the family that's restoring the house on East 37th Street. This is not, uh, these are, some of our awardees have been here before, they know the drill, they've gotten things. This is someone who has, is not that, that profile. And I think for someone like that to come in and be honored is a very significant thing. I would tell you that from living right around the corner, that that house restoration saved that block. That block was in a very rough spot, and that shows the value of restoration in the residential areas. It really breathed new life into that block. So, I 100% uh, I, I, I agree with you, but I think there's more value and having a ceremony where there's only 80 people knowing this and seeing this as opposed to being able to do it virtually and we could possibly have the whole entire city watching it 
on, on Channel 77. And, and by the way, I think there's absolutely a lot of value. The city of Patterson needs to have a wonderful reputation. And I think to have a, some something like this that is a wonderful celebration of accomplishment is fantastic. It's certainly the city needs good PR. Uh, the, the, the commission continues year after year after year doing these dinners. It's our mantra. Uh, sometimes we're on, on some heroes in the city. Uh, I think the idea of a coming together and celebration is invaluable. And uh, I would certainly personally, as a commissioner, not chair right now, just chair of the committee, say I would support, and we can't do it tonight, obviously, but I would, uh, my own opinion coming back will be looking to the 2021 in person, but leave being open this celebration in the fall for accomplishment. Uh, and I don't know how, what, what, you know, I know, I know we've all done these virtual things, but we got to nail it right. So I leave that open, uh, but I certainly uh, find value in each one, but the big pinnacle is the in-person meeting. So uh, is there any other thoughts, or if not, I would ask uh, the chair to take over this, because I have people looking at me right now saying, we were supposed to walk out the door at 8.30, so I have family. So I'm, I must sign out of the meeting. Um, and so, uh, Chairman, I can turn it over to you uh, if the commissioners would like to continue. I have some little direction here, what your thoughts are. Thank you, Joanne. What we will do is you, you've taken everyone's opinion, and it is the committee's decision to bring the resolution into what you guys think is appropriate. So we'll leave that to you. So thank you. Thank you all, and good night. Good night, Joanne. Good night, Joanne. Good night, good night Joanne. Okay. We will now, sorry about jumping around, but we'll go back to number to begin administrative matters, A, COVID-19 protocols. Uh, uh, we're, in the middle, we're in the middle of a motion, aren't we? No. I thought no. we were. No, we were no, the motion was not made. A motion was not made. Okay, then can I make a motion on that? I make a motion that we uh, don't have a in- uh, a dinner in 2020, and we push it off to 2021. A second. We can do it uh, virtual. We can talk about a virtual some other time. Yes, that's uh, absolutely. Yes. I second that. Okay, so now we have a first of the, and second of a motion on the floor to uh, postpone the dinner to 2021. Is that correct, guys? Yes, and also to and also we'll talk about a virtual meeting at another and at another time. I understand. So the motion is simply to postpone the dinner uh, to uh, twenty twenty one, and we're not even going to put a date right now, right? Correct. Okay. So we have a first and a second. Ken, do you have a um, do you have a motion sheet ready for taking a call or roll call? Yes, I do. But I do, I do have a question. Uh, on what Richard said, I, I thought I think what Richard was referencing is that when we were going to uh, pass a resolution to have Romy pass the motion to have Romy prepare a resolution for the award nominees, what happened with that? No, actually, it was that um, the the committee chair asked the attorney to prepare a resolution for the next meeting. Uh, to present as part of the committee report for this role, this uh, list of awardees to be considered for adoption. That's what the discussion was. Understood. So I'll do roll call for this motion. Uh, Commissioner Garcia Leon. Yes. Excuse me, Tim, I'm going to interrupt because if there's not enough commissioners here now, if two or more are gone, then I should vote as well. Is, is that correct? And and I didn't vote on the other one for Lambert Castle, and Kelly had recused herself. So I just want to be clear on what we're doing. Um, yes, you're right. You're right, Joyce. Uh, there's two commissioners gone now. 
on uh, Nakima and uh, Joanne Wiley. So your vote right. will be recorded along okay. along with Maribel's. Okay, I didn't want to interrupt before on the Lambert one, and it doesn't make a difference. It, you know, it's going to be unanimous. I was obviously going to vote yes, but I think it would have been nice to have all a uh, full contingency voting yes on that project. Uh, yes, that, that was an error on my part. I apologize, Commissioner Corbo. Yes, um, and this is for delaying it to 21. Correct. My vote is yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Tate. Yes. Commissioner, Commissioner Wiley. Absent. Commissioner Redmond. Absent. Commissioner Holter. Yes. Commissioner Simpson. Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Rafael. Yes. Chair Ahmed. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Tim. Now we'll move ahead to item number three in the agenda, administrative matters, A, COVID-19 protocols. Jeffrey, do you have any updates for us on this? Uh, very brief. Just that, as, as uh, reported at the last meeting, uh, the city of Patterson is bringing its uh, workforce back in um, from sort of totally being, you know, most everyone being at home to alternating uh, schedule. So we're, we're kind of backing up and we're bringing more people into the offices. Um, we're also, you know, meeting more, um, kind of open public hours. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that for the work that Tim and I do every day, we've been already on an alternating schedule, uh, together, working together in the office and then staying home and working together. Um, and that will, you know, that's continuing now. So our workflow is the same. And in fact, I'd like to point out that we uh, spent a, a, a good amount of time this month in the East Side Park Historic District, and um, we've sent up, you know, a, a good number of um, referrals to our zoning officer for uh, changes being made to buildings like siding and roofs and things like that without uh, review. So uh, we've been out uh, doing field work as well. Uh, so we can, I wanted to also um, mention that until the city adopts a in-person meeting protocol, when, when the city feels that it's time to do that, like when the council and the other boards start to meet in person, that's when we'll start to meet in person. Um, I'm anticipating right now that we have a special meeting for Hinchel State coming up on um, July 10th and that it will be done virtually. And then we have a reorganization meeting on July 20th. And I right now also am anticipating that one will be done um, uh, virtually. Uh, then after that, you know, I guess we don't know if August will bring uh, more uh, ability for us to actually be in person again. We'll just have to see. But I just wanted to tell you what I'm anticipating uh, for these next couple of meetings. So that was uh, what, uh, my report on, the, uh, on on COVID protocol. Thank you. So I think you actually touched this briefly, but item number B under administrative matters, HPC staff resuming operations. Is there any other update that you have other than what you provided? No, it's the same. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now we'll move forward to item number five, old business and correspondence, director's report. Jennifer. Okay, yes, uh, Great, Great Falls National Historical Park. Um, if people have been driving around the falls um, and over the park, you'll see that uh, the park is, you know, has been open and that we've had some really you know, wonderful weather over the weekends and people are really are turning out. Uh, to enjoy the good weather and um, uh, the waterfall. So it you know, it's still makes me think of uh, the Quarry Long project. And I wanted to tell you that 
Uh, we're in a spot now where we are assembling the budget and the funding for, especially for the uh, remediation part of the project. So we have uh, the right funding to match the budget uh, when we get ready for bidding. So I, I believe that we're uh, about a month away from uh, having our construction documents start. And um, I'm hoping that uh, in, in the end of the summer, we, we may even be able to uh, get, in, get into bidding for, uh, for the project because I think people will really enjoy the, um, uh, the, the new uh, Corridor Park opening. Meanwhile, as you know, the ATP site uh, continues to uh, uh, work uh, with the EPA and uh, the city on the, um, the ATP fencing. Um, the EPA has not been able to, because of COVID protocol, has not been able to uh, conduct field work. Uh, so going out for bidding and doing site walks at the, um, at the site has not been possible. Uh, we're also looking to get um, SHPO review of the fence project, so we're still a little bit away from getting that project underway. Um, hopefully in about a month's time, we may see the bidding start. That's my projection for that. Uh, that's kind of what I'm feeling might be the case. I'd like to report that the memorandum of agreement, which is the Levine Reservoir Containment Project, has been signed by uh, all parties. Um, I think there's only one more signature from the uh, Council for Historic Preservation, that's sort of the National Council. Um, after everyone else signs, they get the last uh, signature. I think that's the level that it's at now. But once the MOA um, is completed, uh, the you know the Preservation Commission is folded into the MOA as being um, uh, one of the consulting parties of, of interest um, as uh, preservation review goes forward for um, for the different matters on these tanks. So I would expect that. Um, very soon, we will see a presentation from the engineers. Uh, once you know, now that we have the signatures done of the of the different um, uh, preservation factors that are agreed upon for the site, like vegetation, the color of the tanks, the preservation of the uh, fence line, of the uh, um, the the large uh, stone block wall on Grant Street. There's just sort of a handful of issues, most of them are pretty rudimentary preservation type matters that you'll be able to nail pretty easily. The other the other one be like, what color do you paint these tanks? That's something that uh, the commission will be looking at, I think, soon. So that's a process that has taken you know many years to come to this point. Uh, this also means that there'll be an escrow account established uh, where there'll be um, $2 million put into that account for another committee will start to be organized and convene about um, the raceway and the feasibility study for being able to share water between the raceway and the, um, the Levine uh, Reservoir site. So that's another part of the uh, MOA. But I think that was an important uh, milestone uh, that, that we've reached that I wanted to tell you about. We have received a design review application with like 90% drawings for 50 Spruce Street. That's the last mill uh, Rogers building to be uh, rehabilitated on Spruce Street next door to 32 Spruce, the NJCDC building. I'm sure you all know, know which one that is. Uh, they came to us to talk about like doing emergency repairs on the roof. Um, and now that we've received their application and we're going to review it and probably set it up for um, for your review uh, in the next available meeting is, is what I think is going to happen with that one. So um, we are also working very intensely now in conjunction. I'm sure you've all heard about uh, the council is, is, been, is meeting to consider a, an important resolution that supports the project that includes the Great Falls uh, Visitor Center that, or the Hamilton Center that we saw the presentation about just a, a couple of meetings ago. Um, we we uh, um, are working um, to put together the uh, very the complexity of the land transfer to the National Park Service. So on this side, we're working with um, 
uh, the, the land transfer, and on the other side, they're working with the resolutions to organize the uh, the financial aspects to make that project uh, start to go forward. Because like Inchlow Stadium, it's also on a timeline. As you know, with Inchlow Stadium, which is also in the Great Falls District, we just completed a planning board um, review on Monday. This is why we were asked to swap our meeting dates. Um, our meeting date was supposed to be for Monday. Um, we switched it to today so that there would be a meeting of the planning board to get the planning review that we just completed last month. So our review of the stadium last month went to the planning board and it was passed uh, unanimously. And I want to mention that there is a condition that the um, applicant needs to provide an easement along the subdivision line for the trail that we discussed at the last meeting. So that is going to happen as part of the site plan approval um, after the comments that uh, you know were forwarded on to, to the planning board. Uh, coming up on July 9th, like the day before our meeting, the Board of Adjustment will hear the last part of the Inchlow Stadium project, uh, which has to do with a change of use variance uh, for the uh, residential building that's also part of the project, as you all know. And that uh, building is outside of the district, so we will not be reviewing that. Um, as, as you remember, uh, when we, we talked about uh, last last month, uh, but that will sort of complete the major planning approvals that the project needs to assemble so that they can make their next milestone of, of funding for funding parameters. Um, the construction documents and things are moving ahead very rapidly, and that's why we've asked for a special meeting on July 10th to do a design review uh, stage of the sort of final plans or the, you know, the 90% plans of what the stadium, uh, what's going to happen at the stadium construction wise. So we'll do a design review at that time. Uh, I look forward to getting the, you know, the, the documents, like I think it's July 1st. I'm supposed to be receiving the documents that I can then pass out to you. I'm going to try to do the same thing that we did tonight because the documents for these, these projects are so massive. Uh, instead of sending you the whole roll of plans, I'll, I'll like to uh, try to send a presentation that kind of just streamlines and guides uh, guides you through all the different um, parts of the project. Um, unfortunately, we've also found out that um, during this difficult time of uh, public unrest um, related to uh, riots and uh, and and um, and then some of the damages that, that has gone along with that across the country. We've also experienced some of this in the Great Falls District where our, our Larry Do Doby mural uh, was sprayed with some graffiti. We've asked the art, uh, the artist, um, Paul and Inspire, if they would uh, go back and correct, you know, correct it or paint over it basically and put the mural back as soon as possible. We also right. learned uh, from Jimmy Richardson that there was vandalism at the Underground Railroad uh, site. Uh, one of the plaques was removed uh, from the front of the um, of this of the statue that's there, and uh, not related to the riots. But before, we also learned that unfortunately, a bronze plaque um, that was dedicated to the firemen who died in the Meyer Brothers fire. Um, there was a commemorative plaque there on Main Street that was also stolen recently. Um, and that, that's under investigation, of course, by the police. Um, we also have removed, uh, this week we've removed squatters that had found a clever way to occupy the, the, um, Ivanhoe building. Um, and so we were able to abate that before it resulted in another, you know, disastrous fire. So uh, 29 McBride that had caught fire, if you remember, in last report has been stabilized instead of a full demolition. It's been sort of part, partially demolished. All of the loose materials uh, have been removed and the site is pretty clean. All the openings are boarded up. The owner still intends to try to salvage the shell of the historic shell of the building and go from there. So I think that's um, a good amount of stuff to talk, tell you about what's going on in the Great Falls District. John Franco, downtown. John, John Franco. Yes, go ahead. I had um, a question about or, or, or a comment regarding the mural. Um, I guess near the Larry Doby. 
No, I'm talking about, no, I'm yeah. talking about the, the mural over by the Great Falls um, on the um, auxiliary building. You mean uh, the one on Mary Ellen Kramer Park side? Yes. Yeah, the Larry Doby one, yeah. Um, the, the mural next to it, uh, did we ever have a conversation with the um, artist? Uh, because I believe we um, asked um, for specific wording um, that wasn't um, placed onto the mural. There was a correction. That okay. Was okay, yes, I would have to go back and look at our minutes and talk with you offline about what you remember, you know, we directed him because... I mean, I, rem I remember going going on memory of the meeting. He did say he was going to paint uh, the you know the Larry Doby mural, what was already painted. But then he told us he was going to paint the other side of the door as well. And uh, we did discuss particular wording. I remember that it was the on first plan industrial city. Okay, so um, I'll have to catch up with uh, with you and uh, look at the official record of the meeting and see what the discrepancies are and then bring that up with him. I also believe, I didn't see it myself, but he's um, started to work on the uh, NJCDC project that we reviewed. Um, um, it's, I think it's 59 Spruce Street, if I remember the address. And we had also, in the same token, we had also asked for some changes to the design. We did, we did a lot of discussion and thought about that design in, in, in the meeting. And there was no follow-up. Uh, and if I, again, I, I didn't get a chance to go down there this week to verify that he had already been painting. But I understand that he's the one who's supposed to be painting it. And if he's painting and we didn't get the follow-up, that's also not what we uh, asked for in our design review. Yes, so um, I think. I'll address. Yeah, I'll address these things first thing in, uh, next week before it goes too far. Okay. So um, the Downtown Commercial Historic District, uh, I wanted to mention, of course, the Firehouse Project you already heard about. And the across the street from the Firehouse, it was the former Greenbounce property that we reviewed for a new building and demolition of two warehouse buildings to replace with a new building and then all of the rehab of the historic buildings along Washington Street that goes with that. We've been getting um, phone calls um, to start to talk to the architects about different issues and they've been actively like kind of stripping out the inside of the warehouse building, getting them ready for demolition. So they are moving forward on that product, well, that project. Also, um, the 114 Ellison Street, we just received a repointing plan and they're starting to uh, do the exterior work that needs to be done because the interior work is all completed now. So we have an arrangement with them to have the exterior work done in not more not more than three months. Uh, so they are getting to work on the exterior. We should see that building also be done, um, you know, by the fall. That's the agreement that we we have with them. So the those are the Charles Florio projects, and they are like moving ahead accordingly, and they're coordinating with us, and they're. Um, they, they've been very respectful of the process, even though it's the first time they're going through it, and they, had, they seem to have, um, you know, every intention of um, uh, following the commission's uh, um, authorities and uh, and conditions. So I'm, I'm pleased to report that to you. We have um, also I want I want to thank Tim for being diligent on um, violations uh, of you know again putting up signs and things in the downtown as well as in the east side, he's been sort of doing, taking that on more um, uh, where he's taking the photos and referring them forward to enforcement. And um, that's, you know, that's exactly what we need to do during this time. We had brought this up a couple months ago and uh, we thought that people would be out working uh, on their buildings without proper review because it's a difficult time to really, you know, everything isn't really normal uh, with regard to, uh, you know, uh, how many eyes are on the street. So. Um, I wanted to also tell you, in, under item number two, Lucas Hill Memorial Park, we received our approval from the SHPO. We've had discussions about Great Falls Historic District lighting. We're planning to have uh, another meeting that will bring together uh, cost estimates and final sort of, you know, 90% plans and specifications as the city gets ready to see 
if it wants to go out for bidding on that project. So we are we have that in hand. I've also put out my first call to the Votto House to um, start working with them on interpretive um, displays that we talked a lot about at the at that design review. I told you about 29 McBride Fire demolition already and about the downtown commercial uh, historic district projects. Um, Eastside Park Historic District projects, you saw photos of 30, East 37th Street. Uh, that project is, uh, we saw the inside and the outside, and it really is an outstanding job, a very nice uh, piece of work that uh, he's, he's doing. And um, we, we also visited um, uh, some, some uh, applicants with regard to solar panels and got more of a handle on some of the, some of the work that was um, installed uh, without uh, uh, approvals, and we've been reporting that. So we're expecting now to start doing the follow-up. Um, one, one point that I wanted to mention that we did not forget was on 40th East 40th Street, there was an applicant who came in after he had built this giant, like, dormer on the, if you remember, the single center dormer on the front of the building facing the street. And, um, we brought, we brought that in for design review and gave very specific instructions on how to change the dormer and minimize it, uh, and eliminate the one on, uh, the, the back or uh, all these different um, uh, conditions. Um, the the applicant has made made none of those changes. Um, he defied all of the uh, meetings and the uh, conditions that were you know passed. And um, we took a trip by there. We see that the project was finished and looks like someone is uh, pro is probably occupying the building now. But upon um, checking into it, we found that there's no certificate of occupancy, no permit closures. It's got a lot of problems, and the uh, construction official looks like he's going to start um, getting his um, uh, inspection inspectors to uh, look at the appropriate violations to be issued, including occup occup occupying the building without a CL. So um, we're, we're following up on that. I wanted to let you know about that. So our historic sites projects, uh, we have just uh, shown you a, uh, a wonderful project for Lambert Castle. I wanted to tell you that uh, the armory site that uh, the RPM group now owns, the Florio group now owns, um, is, uh, they're also uh, getting ready to take the underground storage tanks out of the site. So they're looking forward to mobilizing uh, on, on that site as well for uh, I think for construction, we talked about the exchange of our salvaged materials and brick, and so I think that one is sort of just starting to come, you know, get uh, kind of rising up. Um, the um, Huntsman's Corner, I already mentioned about Huntsman's Corner, and um, applied for a grant from the New Jersey Historical Commission to support um, uh, historical research about the Underground Railroad in Patterson um, to go along with our National Park Service uh, grant uh, to do additional um, a study uh, to look and see if we have um, African-American sites of interest that might be eligible for inclusion on the register. So that's another thing that we've been working on. Any questions? Everybody's so probably sleeping by now. A couple of um, uh, violations that I sent you pictures and stuff for, they've all been turned into the, uh, to have an inspector look at them? Yes, I believe so. Tim, can you answer that? Y yes, I can. Richard, both of the addresses that you emailed me about, the those photographs, as well as some that John Franco and I took, have been coupled with the memorandum that we sent to the zoning officer. Okay, that one on the, uh, that, that the first one I sent you, they've completed the work now. They stuckled the front instead of siding it. Uh, yeah, I, I did not know that detail. Um, I will have to check up on the site again on Monday. Uh, I only got out there the one day to take my photographs, and then I used the ones that you sent also, Richard. 
Yeah. I certainly agree that that is very upsetting. And John Franco, as the director, will follow up with the zoning officer as soon as possible. Thank you. Yeah, so we also have approval for the Eastside Park uh, trail improvement project uh, that has to, it has to do with the presentation that I made to you about the historic trails and the chip seal. If you remember, the SHPO has reviewed that and have provided their approval. The only thing they wanted to know about was the bollards. They wanted to know if the bollards that we're going to use metal ones and uh, they'll be the same you know, color as the, as the benches that we're uh, we prescribed. Um, so we're also going to be meeting about moving that project forward as well. Looks like it's Joyce. Do uh, have, you have your hand up, Joyce? I'm sorry. I didn't realize it must have been up all this while. No. <laughs> okay. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report under item five, old business. Thank you, Jeff Franco. I would like us to move ahead to number seven under the agenda public portion. Do I have a motion to open the public portion, please? Motion. Take motion. Do I have a second? Okay, this is Rich. Second. Tim Rocco. Commissioner Corbo. Yes. Commissioner Garcia Leon. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. Commissioner Wiley. He's absent. He's absent. absent. Commissioner Redmond. He's absent. He's absent. Commissioner Walter. Yes. Commissioner Simpson. Yes. Vice Chair Rafael. Yes. Chair Ahmed. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. So, Jim Franco, would you like to say the number? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. For uh, members of the public that are attending the meeting uh, virtually, this is a time for you to call in with any questions from the commissions or comments under public portion. Uh, if you'd like to do so, the number to call is 973-321-1579. Enter the access code 711-680-0024. This information is also available on the City of Patterson main page website. The address is pattersonnj.gov. If you scroll to the bottom of the page under the event section, you'll see that this meeting is advertised. It says HPC meeting. Uh, if you click on that link, it'll take you to another page that will give you this call in information that I just read aloud. 973-321. 1579, access code 711-680-0071. At this time, we're going to wait for several minutes to see if anyone would like to call in. I'd like to note the time is 9.07. Noted. We need some background here. It's like being in an elevator, right? I have elevator music. Yeah, I bet you do, Mohammed. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, I just received a message that there are no callers. Just wait until 9.10. It's right now 9.09. Okay, okay. the time is now 9-10. Yeah, this is Russell. I can make the motion we close the public question. Second. Thank you. Tim Rogo. Commissioner Corbo. Yes. Commissioner Garcia Leon. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. Commissioner Wiley. Absence. Absence. Redmond. Absence. Commissioner Walter. Yes. Commissioner Simpson. Yes. Yes. Commissioner Russell. Yes. Chair Ahmed. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Tim. Can we get a motion to adjourn the meeting at 9 11 p.m., please? Motion. Kelly first and Tate the second. Mm -hmm. Roll call, Tom. Commissioner Cuomo. Yes. Commissioner Garcia Leon. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. Commissioner Wiley. Absent. Commissioner Redmond. Absent. Commissioner Walter. Yes. Commissioner Simpson. Yes. Vice Chair Russell. Yes. Chair Ahmed. Yes. Meeting adjourned. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank, thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Have a, have a great holiday, everybody. Have a great holiday weekend. Kelly, great presentation. Uh, you too. Thank you. 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 Thank you.